And I realized walking up to the bar for that last rep, 1306, three years ago, I told myself, I told God, I said, get me through this and I'm done. This is the last time I want to be able to say, I don't care what happens. I am here today with Brian Carroll. Brian has the all-time world world leading biggest squat. It's very kind of hard for, for normal people to comprehend just how much weight that is. So just just up front for me and for everybody, that's six of me. That's an enormous quantity of weight. So Brian, I'm super excited for you to join me. Thank you so much. How are you doing today? Doing pretty well, man. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, you know, it's been three years since that big squat. And uh, I'm actually working on a documentary that kind of parallels Gift of Injury, but gives you a visual with the videos and everything and me talking about what the mindset was going into that, the complete rebuild, some early videos of me squatting just a plate in the bar or just a bar and working back up over time. And then eventually getting back to that 1,306 pound squat. The one thing that made me step away three years ago was not my physical ability. It was my mental ability to go to 100% neural drive, 100% turned on on that particular day that I have to train, and just being so myopic that uh, it was time to move on to the next thing. And I was pretty much just getting burnt out. You know, e even though my, my rehab process is documented in Gift of Injury, it, it's it went pretty good considering all the things I was dealing with, but I didn't realize actually, and I never really talked about this, how much of a toll it took on me mentally. I, I think something that caught up with me uh, years down the road that I didn't realize because my back being so effed up, I just compartmentalized all that, right? And didn't even think about that or process that and just went right into finding the cure, find the cure. Well, then when I hooked up with Dr. McGill, then I had the cure. So it was all the cure. Build, rebuild, rebuild. Stay on track. Don't let anyone uh, bait you into doing too much or don't worry about what people are saying online. But all of that type of focus, if you have too much of that, it's just like, you know, I was lucky enough to have 21 years of doing that. But after a while, the drugs, taking the drugs, which are necessary to lift that type of weight, in my opinion, in my experience at least, um, they really mess with your head and it makes general life difficult. Work, getting up on time, obligations around the holidays and all that stuff. After a while, I just couldn't tolerate the drugs even though I didn't run crazy doses of drugs compared to some people. But we could talk about the, the dosages that I like to run and I found were best. But still, it's still better than what anyone would say would be optimal for a even killed mindset. So way more than that, right? Super physiological still, but nonetheless, after a while, I just couldn't tolerate it anymore. And it was time to step back. I hit that big squat. I kind of went out on top and uh, I knew that I wasn't likely to replicate anything like that going out. So it was just like, I have baby girls now. It's time to go on to the next thing. Let's focus on helping as many people as possible going forward. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much I want to pick up just just on that intro, but I think maybe the first thing is is just the the mental aspect to it, right? That that kind of you have to go all in, and you, you've spoken about this, but this idea of like nothing else matters at that point with that kind of weight, you know, that's almost six hundred kilograms for our British uh, British viewers. Like, it's incredibly taxing obviously physically, but also mentally. So I was wondering, you've talked about going to this kind of dark place and all that sort of thing. What goes through your head like 30 seconds before you walk up to the monolith? What, what's going on there? I'm walking up and I'm, I'm usually pretty scared. Probably similar to what a UFC fighter's facing walking into the octagon. I've never seen anyone in the UFC at least decide to turn around and not fight. They at least made it to the octagon, even if they tapped out early or wanted to check out early, right? Just went down. But um, it's not like I'm going to do that, but it's definitely one of those feelings that if the roof caved in, 
and they had to suddenly stop the meet, I wouldn't be like really upset about it. I would be, but I wouldn't be. I'm, I'm kind of looking for an out in some ways, but that's just the weak side of me talking. And then I just keep pushing ahead and know that, hey, I'm prepared. And then I think about how much I want to get to lift. I play the movie forward sometimes and think, how mad am I going to be at myself two weeks from now or three weeks from now if I miss this lift? Do it perfect. Lock in. I'll think about other fa failures that I've had in my personal life, my lifting life, and all that culminates into one nastiness, one rigidness, stiffness, and being determined that no matter what, when I picked up that weight, I would control it, and I know that if I can pick it up and stabilize with it, that I could squat it. That was my thought. Even though I'd never handled more than 12.05 in my life, before that day, I peaked in such a way that I was uh, as ready to handle that kind of weight uh, without handling it before as I could be. Just by backing off for a couple of weeks and resting, going into the meet, having super uh, delusional belief in myself almost like, hey, I'm not cutting weight anymore. I cut weight for the better part of 20 years. Going into the meet, rested, being 30 pounds heavier. There's really no limit to what I can do. So if I can pick this weight up, I know I can squat it. But um, a funny story about that, the, the the week or two before I was getting some treatment done by my PT, just on my quads and just maintenance stuff, nothing. It was more of a massage. And uh, I told her that, hey, if things go well this weekend on a fourth attempt, I might uh, go over 1,300. And she says, isn't your PR you just did 12.05? And I said, yeah. And then she kind of just clammed up a bit for the rest of the session. She's a good friend. And she told me after the meet, she said she was concerned for my well-being and my health and uh, was praying for me all weekend. I'm not surprised. I mean, it, it's it's incredible to, to speak to someone who has set an all-time world record. Nobody had ever done that before. So you've got to think that that's really, you know, by definition, it's pushed the limits of human performance. I mean... I'd love to hear, like, are we close to the limit? Is is Because a human can't be capable of squatting 2,000 pounds, surely. Like, I understand that it's equipped. I understand that you're going to be, you know, super physiological in other ways. But if there's anybody qualified to make a statement on this, like, that's got to be, that's got to be right up on the limits of any kind of human performance, surely. Yeah, I, I've had this discussion a couple times, and I wonder if it's, it's somewhere between 1,306 and 2,000 pounds, I would say for certain, right? Probably closer to 1,400 pounds, no matter what the um, suit, the squat suit or equipment changes to, the belt, the knee wraps. I, 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 it hasn't changed very much in the last 20 years because I've been in the game every step of the way. Some things have gotten easier to use, but they haven't given you more performance. That's the, that's the thing with the squat. Um, so I think what it comes down to is the, are the small joints, um, the, the little bones in the foot, the arches of the feet, the muscles and, and everything of the, of the arch of the foot, um, the ankle, what can the ankle hold? What can the, the, the tip fib hold without just breaking compression fracture, whatever it may be. Um, what's the ultimate loading limit axial wise for the spine? No matter what, how much uh, intra-abdominal pressure do you have to have to be able to squat 1,400? I, I don't know. These are all tests that haven't been done, I don't think. Um, but I think that it's going to come down to the little things. Maybe it's brain pressure. Maybe at a certain point, they just uh, it's going to make something explode. You know, I, I, I don't know. But blood pressure, all that stuff. I mean, it, it's it's amazing to kind of think about. And I think... The other thing that to, to be aware of is is with the four minute mile, for example, Roger Bannister, nobody, you know, it, nobody thought it could be done. And then a ton of people did it. But with your squat, that hasn't happened, right? It's still a world record. And that was October 2020. Yeah. And um, what's interesting is the first thousand pound squat was done in the 90s at some point, I think. I, I should know that better, but I do know the rest of them. 1100 was 2003 by Steve Goggins. He was 41. Then you had 2006, 2007, a guy named Mike Miller who recently passed away 
Uh, he was the first 1,200-pound squatter. He actually wrestled in the WWE, I think, at one point. But um, that was the first 1,200-pound squat. So it was 14 or so years before the 1,300-pound barrier w was broke. It's broken. So I, I don't know. Um, it's got to be up there as far as the ultimate uh, human limits. Um, I, I really don't. I'm not interested in, in trying to realize that for myself because it's it's there. And I realized walking up to the bar for that last rep, 1306, three years ago, I told myself, I told God, I said, get me through this and I'm done. This is the last time I want to be able to say, I don't care what happens. If I pick it up and my heart explodes, so be it. If I have an aneurysm, so be it. If my knees explode, so be it. But this is the last time I want to put it all on the line and let's do this. So I got under there with that thinking like, hey, if I, I blow up, I'll just be like, hey, man, I went out really trying. It's it's amazing to have insight into that mentality and the fact that things changed for you, I guess. So, I mean, w was that a factor of like having kids, you said, and obviously you'd be married for a while? At, at some point you had to stop just being, you know, all in on that and, and consider the other priorities in the next 40, 50 years of, you know, hopefully of your life, right? For the longest time, I didn't ever see myself living in my 30s and 40s. So during this time, my first all-time world record squat was in 06. And during this time, I was so focused. Nothing else mattered. Nothing mattered in my life. I went through girlfriends, and I didn't have too many jobs, but I would change jobs if it meant more time to train, more optimal. But during this time, it's all that mattered to me. And I never thought about, okay, what about after 26? What about after 27? I didn't care. It was 25, 26, 27 Nothing else mattered. I probably wasn't going to see that, you know, long for whatever reason. And I'm just living it to its fullest. And this is all that matters to me. That mindset got old to me. Um, just having one focus. Uh, it, it got old to the people around me. And, yeah, it just made me kind of unhappy after a long time. Com combined, compacted with the drug use and uh, put the stress you know, not just from the drug use, but the stress of demanding so much of yourself mentally and physically year after year after year. Uh, after a while, I knew that the time was coming, you know, towards the end for sure. Um, the week of the meet, I kind of just knew, okay, this is it. No matter how it goes, I need to step away because, uh, you know, I'm all in for this one, but I don't want to do it anymore. The twin girls absolutely changed things. In a month, a month before uh, they were born, right when the pandemic hit, I was having a podcast with Dave Tate on Table Talk, and I told him, I said, I'm worried that I'm not going to want to do this anymore once they're born. And he goes, you might, but then that'll be good because then you'll have a reason to quit and you'll you know, have a reason to walk away and something will keep your attention. I kind of knew that was foreshadowing. I knew that my desires would change. And I'd be more aware of my mortality too. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think, and you'd had a 20 plus year career, right? Broken records at multiple weight classes, all this. So I guess in some ways it's easier to walk away because you walked away on your own terms on top, right? Rather than if you'd failed that squat, do you think you would have been able to walk away? I probably would have been able to walk away because my third attempt was 1287. And that was still the biggest squat ever done. Okay. So the third was world record too. And then I rebroke the world record by 30 uh, some pounds uh, or 29 pounds, whatever it is on the third, on the fourth. Okay. So they allow you the, the, the extra attempt for the world record essentially, right? Because I made my third and I was within 20, I think it's within 10 kilos of the world record. Well, since I'd said it, I had an option to do a fourth. That's it's it's such interesting it's such interesting stuff i think and so i'd like to rewind just for a little bit and talk about brian growing up like what sort of kid were you i i've read you know and, and listened to things about you know you you locking yourself in a gym overnight in like 11th grade and you were already you know pretty strong when benching 315 so that's just over 140 kilos for our british that's the sort of amount that i press and you were 11th grade, right? So how old is that? 14, 15, 16? Yeah, I was 16. 
So you had a lot of promise early on, but can you talk a little bit about your childhood and like how you kind of came to develop obviously this, this incredible physical strength, but, but also the mental strength and the mindset. I think that'd be interesting. So I, I grew up playing baseball actually, and I uh, was a pretty good athlete. I was really quick. I wasn't fast. So I ran, you know, around a four, six or four, seven, 40 yard dash, which is not, it, it's, it's okay. Right. It's not like, I wasn't nearly the fastest guy on the team, but I could get to 20 yards super quick. I would be running with the four, three guys, the first 10 yards, 15 yards, and they'd just pull away. I had no top end uh, running speed, but I was always explosive and quick and strong playing baseball dabble in some football and wrestling but I really got into being a gym rat in high school and after high school and it's really just what I put all my focus in you know I joined the gym the local gym when I turned 16 and it was a key gym at at that time so if I got in there before 11 p.m I could stay in there because it had a secondary lock and it would lock you out but obviously you could hit the hit the pad and you could go out so I would just uh, stay in there sometimes till past 1 a.m. just training. And I didn't have cable at my house. So I would walk on the treadmill and just watch ESPN or something like that, too. I, instead of going out and partying, I, I just, you know, I, I hang out with some of the people now that I did in high school 25 years ago. And so it's funny. They, they've known me this whole time. But for a gap of 10 to 20 years, they didn't see me very much. They would just see my lifts on Facebook or here, you know, whatever. But it's funny, I'm, I, I, I'm the same person I was back then. But I was just super focused on training. I didn't date a lot. It was just my, everything I did while they were out partying and wondering why I didn't want to go party and stuff. Now they're like, dude, you knew better than all of us. When I really didn't, I, that's just what came to me. I didn't know that, oh, I'm going to be, you know, doing this 25 years from now. I didn't think that at all. I just knew that, it's something I'm going to do right now, and I shouldn't be out partying if I want to, uh, I don't know, be a good kid. It, it says a lot about your mentality, though, that you were able to kind of show that commitment early on. So talking of mentality and, and talking about those kind of things, Gift of Injury is your book with, with Dr. McGill, Professor McGill. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about you know, how the injury happened. So it didn't actually happen how people are going to think it happened, right? Because it was a police academy scholarship. I wonder if you could take the story from here. Yeah, so in July of 2009, I'd already had a world record uh, from 06 at 220 with 1,030. I squared 1,000 pounds uh, there, then 1,030 for the all-time world record. In 09, I was trying out for a police academy scholarship and it was a July morning, so it was very humid. And I was running full speed at about 270 to hurdle over a barricade. And there was some morning dew on it. When I went to jump over, I slipped and my legs kicked over and I landed right on my ass. And um, I got up, finished the obstacle course, but my legs weren't really working very well. It was really weird. Um, then I went and finished it, obviously, and then went down and laid in the parking lot for like 30 minutes. The police actually stationed parking lot for a while and just laid there hurting and then when i could get up excuse me i got up and uh drove home and uh rested for a week or two and then squatted 1100 for the first time and pulled 800 for the first time like a couple months later three or four months later so this is the thing you, you kind of recovered enough to well you clearly recovered somewhat right to set set these records but it was a few years before you actually kind of gave in because you must have been managing pain, managing difficulty because you continued, as you said, setting these records competing. But it was a few years before you actually reached out to Professor McGill, right? Yeah, so I, I, I would get in and out of some pain, but taking time off, it would alleviate it. Then in 2011, I squatted the all-time world record at 275 uh, with 1185 and, and something happened with my back during that. And then it started regressing even more going into 2012. I took most of that year off after uh, doing the Arnold, which I won in 2012. I took re- the rest of that year off pretty much. In 2013, that's around the time in Gift of Injury we talked about. I was doing a lot of the epidurals and spinal injections. Um, I was doing all the PT stuff, all the foam rolling and, and all that. And uh, so finally, after I limped through the Arnold and got runner up, I should have won that one. 
I said, okay, we got to make a change. And that's when I started pursuing surgery more. And then finally in May of, uh, uh, May of 2013, that's when I went up to see Dr. McGill. Yeah, but it was, it was like a little bit better and then we get worse and a little bit better and then worse. And eventually it just cascaded to where I was having pain at all times. And he said, so you went to see him, right? And, and he told you, as I understand it, that you pretty much had to stop training entirely for a period, right? Well, it's even worse than that because he said, you're done. Yeah. You're done competing. And I'm like, what? Well, I didn't know I was going to have to take some time off. So I was cool with that. He told me, you're going to need to back off training, stop beating on your body. Okay, fine. I'll listen to everything you're saying. This is after the five hours we met. But you said you could probably get me out of pain. All he promised me was his best. So I told him once he, once I get out of pain and then I'm going to get back and I want to get my squat record back. There's still more stuff that I want to do. And funny enough, my squat record was broke in 2013. Uh, the, the 1185 was broke at 275. And then I went out breaking the all time record set by the guy that broke my record then. Interesting. In a different class. Yeah. It's funny, right? So yeah. I didn't get my record back and the biggest record regardless. So that, that was cool. Um, but he said that uh, you're done. You got nothing left. If you were my son, I would urge you to retire. And I pushed back. And he goes, okay, for, fine. First things first, get pain-free. Who knows? Maybe you're right. Maybe write a book about, about it. And what happened in 2017? 2017, we wrote uh, Gift of Injury. That was after I wrote the, uh, finished the Arnold uh Won it for the third time, the second time post back injury. And uh, yeah, we wrote the book in 2017. So it really did end up being a book. And yeah, everybody can get that right. Gift of Injury that you co-authored with uh, Professor McGill. Yeah, you can get it on all, all Amazon outlets. We actually have the Kindle now too. Or if you're domestic, get it from PowerRackShrink.com. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's done well. It's helped a lot of people. I mean, I've had a lot of people tell me they can relate to that first uh, intro those first couple of pages about where I was mentally um, after uh, leaving the uh, neurosurgeon that day. Yeah. And I think this is a good time to pick, to pick up on that. So we've talked about you being all in and th that mentality that it takes to, to squat uh, well, any, you, you know, any kind of prodigious weight to just deal with that kind of weight, but you applied, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but almost that same mentality to your recovery, right? So everybody, you're still, you know, in the powerlifting world, right? You're still going to the gym even with people who, who are there by normal people's standards, squatting just insane weights. But what were you doing? And, and what did you call it? Like, what, what were you doing when they were squatting and being like, Brian, you're a world record holder. Like, what are you doing on the floor? They were curious. Dave Tate, you know, he's the one that called it Sil, Sil Pilates. And yeah. uh, they were all to mess with me because I, I talked plenty of trash, you know, during uh, my lifting time. And it was in good fun, you know, just kind of boy talk, but at the same time, or guy talk, at the same time, uh, it was an opportunity for them to kick me a little bit because maybe I get the better of them sometimes. And so they were trying to mess with me about me doing my bird dogs and my silk Pilates. Um, I just stayed disciplined enough to use that same mental focus that I did when I'd be cutting weight or training for a world record or not going out in 11th grade, you know, not going to parties, not drinking. I, um, I use that same focus and went to that same kind of dark place and only focused on this little list of exercises I was allowed to do walking big three push ups, planks, you know, body weight squats or whatever it was at the time. And I just made sure that, yeah, I would let it get under my skin, but it would just not take me off my GPS route. It would just make me more focused to stay on it, actually. That's a lot of mental strength, though, right? Because so many people probably would have given in or like they'd seen some improvement. And we'll talk about this a bit later, but they'll they'll see some improvement and be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go back to it because I'm a bit better. But the fact that you were able to like stay the course and, you know, kind of continue with with what Professor McGill said and like actually allow it to heal we'll talk about this later, but, but pretty much all the way, right? Because 
now you don't, as I understand it, you don't actually have any back pain. There's no, there's no problem. And despite how many world records do you have in the squat or have you broken in the squat? Yeah, I, I broke um, a few. So the 06 one, the not, uh, 11 one, and then the, the, the 2020 one actually was uh, for that day, technically. It was the 308 all-time world record and regardless of body weight. And then again, I broke it. And then so it counts twice, twice, if that makes sense. You've broken a ton of world records. I mean, like, just so people know, you know, this is double digits number of world records, right? Yeah, and yet, yeah. just as testament to what you've done and, and Professor McGill as well, like, you don't even have back pain at the moment, right? Despite everything. I've only had one, really one flare up in the last 10 years since the, seeing Dr. McGill. Now, when I was doing the process initially, the first six months, if I would be out in the yard too much, I'd get some tension and pain, but it wasn't. I knew how to get out of it, just rest for a little bit, maybe go for a walk, maybe lie down on my belly for a bit. Um, I had the strategies there, and that's the key. But I had a flare-up in 2014 when I rushed getting back to on the platform. Uh, after seeing Miguel in 13, I rebuilt, everything went well, and then I turned around and tried to do that next Arnold, and it was just too early. And I had some back pain that day, and I had a little bit of a flare-up, Came back home and uh, kind of refocused, dropped some body weight, gave myself another six months. So I needed about 18 months of healing for this to uh, work for me. And uh, I don't, that, I've only had really one flare up in those 10 years. I don't have any back pain, I don't have any leg pain. The only thing that hurt me sometimes are my feet, and that's because I walk so much trying to drop body weight now. But I, I don't have any back pain, thank God. None, but I, I still adhere to the same principles that Dr. McGill taught me 10 and a half years ago. I move well, I walk every day, I do my core work, and I don't try to cross my tipping point, even though it's much farther you know, than it was 10 years ago. I, I'm not trying to uh, cross that tipping point or make it like crazy for compression tolerance or anything anymore. So I just train for injury resilience now, and it's hard for me to get motivated, honestly, to train because it's, I don't have that tunnel vision to do it so i get lazy sometimes and i've although it's good to be retired from that and back and off i've probably erred on the side of too much recovery too much laziness in the last three years so i'm trying to recalibrate that now pretty much seems like all the time and you you spend a lot of your personal and sorry your professional life now helping other people who've had back injuries right so you're a McGill provider for Florida, right? And you teach some of the McGill, uh, you know, certifications and, and all those sorts of things. So I was wondering if you could just kind of explain a little bit about, you know, your consulting and, and, and what you do now. So I do um, McGill certified provider, as you said, and I do consultations both virtually and ideally in person. And a lot of who I get are general lay people that want to, be uh, a good squatter or deadlifter or bencher, but they screw themselves up in the process and then they can't figure out how to rebuild themselves or get out of back pain or want to avoid a back injury and want a robust program to help avoid that. So I do a little bit of all of that. I do work with some power lifters and strength athletes, strong men, Olympic lifters, power lifters, uh, Highland Games, uh, Green Berets, SEALs, um, so I work with a, a variety of people, and that's a lot of different personalities. But a lot of people I work with are just average Joes that tweak themselves deadlifting 225 or 315 pounds, and they have no idea how to fix themselves. They have no idea how to lift with good form. Um, and then some people I work with are very good at all these things. They just have some flaws in their technique or their recovery or their uh, training intensity and frequency, and I just consult them with that. So... I work with a lot of people on their lifting form, help them get out of back pain, and uh, kind of an overview of their of their training program. I'll take a look at too. And people hear a lot about sort of like sleep hygiene and that sort of thing. And you've alluded to it a few times already, like you know, taking care of yourself and following McGill's principles and all this sort of thing. I was wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about spine hygiene. Yeah. So spine hygiene. Uh, the way I look at it, and uh, I don't want to put words in Dr. McGill's mouth. I've done it a lot, probably. Spine hygiene, the way you move. So avoiding 
the mechanisms of injury that cause your pain and recreate acute microtrauma over and over. And for some people, that's going to be flexion. It might be lateral flexion. It might be extension. It might be compression, um, some kind of shear. But it's avoiding those positions that recreate your injury and letting it desensitize. So for me, my pain generators were, were compression and flexion, some extension, some twisting. I, I was pretty much pained in everything I did. So a neutral spine, I did not have pain. That was the key. So staying in the positions that are pain-free and then allowing yourself to have more pain-free capacity slowly. And then depending on what your goals are, after a time, after you've healed up, then getting back to extension like I did with the bench press and flexion for some things if someone's a, a dancer, a gymnast, or martial artist. But slowly incorporating those things again that caused you pain, but doing so uh, after a period of time. But spine hygiene is the discipline, moving strategies, whether it's using the hips to squat back, the lunge, the hips and the knees to lunge down, the golfer's pickup, like you see a golfer grab their putt out of the hole, just moving well with a little bit of coarse, tuned core stiffness and uh, not creating the injury over and over. That makes a lot of sense. I think uh, Professor McGill talks about not picking the scab, that, that kind yep. of... So I think it's another thing worth mentioning that, in Britain, we'd say horses for courses. I don't know whether you have that phrase in the US, but basically like your spine to squat or any power lifter, but especially yours is going to, you're going to train it and tune it almost like a car in a different way from a ballerina. So I know Professor McGill doesn't like these kind of like one size fits all principles because, you know, what might be appropriate for your back would not be appropriate for a ballerina. So I suppose what I'm saying is that it's important to, to have a personalized approach. So to work with you or, or Professor McGill or even to read its back mechanic, right? There's, I think it's chapter six, is it? Yep, yep. So which, which personally has helped, helped me a lot, for example. So I think one thing I, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about would be the things that you do. So we've talked about, or, or I've talked to McGill about the big three but about other things that, that you do that can help, I'm not going to say everybody, but can help kind of rebuild your back. So I don't want to lead you, but I'm talking about stuff you've mentioned, walks and carries. And Could you talk a bit about that, please? Yeah, so for the things that I used once I was more robust and things I continue to do in, to do this day, things like stir the pot. So planking on a Swiss ball and then doing small circles while keeping the core locked in getting a little bit of T-spine extension. Suitcase carries, I like those bottoms-up carries, so just unilateral carries. Those those couple of things are really great, especially for the strength athlete that's trying to bear compression again. Those are really great tools to uh, help get them a little bit more resilient, uh, build more capacity. And one big thing is, is give them more time to heal so they don't go right back to the barbell and then tweak themselves after three or four weeks back doing that again. Um, any type of plank can be helpful too. Um, you know, I've used some different tricks for the uh, green berets that have to do the sit-up test. So what I'll um, they have to do, let's say, 70 sit-ups in one minute to max out, what they call. Um, so I won't have them do 70, especially if they're post-surgical or they have a disc bulge or something. They, they don't do well with sit-ups. A lot of people don't do well with sit-ups, especially if they're a bigger dude. Um, I'll have him a couple times during the training cycle for the Q course or whatever it may be. Um, I'll have him do maybe a 50% set of like 30 or something like that sit-ups just to get the pattern down. And okay, you got the groove. It feels good. And then we may do it one more time. So like two times going into the, uh, the test, and uh, we'll just work on anti-rotation and planking, front plank, side plank. And then one thing that I, I do with the uh, green berets is I'll have them go to a back extension machine and go up and hold. They'll hold there for time like a plank instead of the bending over and over and over and wearing on the discs and, and everything. Um, just maintaining that posture of the, the rigid core there. And another thing that, I mean, this is such useful information. Uh, Another thing that I know Professor McGill's talked about that would be particularly particularly applicable for, 
you know, strength athletes and, and, and people like you and, and, and even people like me who are not at that, nowhere near that level, to be clear. But leaving sufficient time in between, and I know heavy is a relative term, right? Heavy for me and heavy for you are going to be different, but in between heavy work, right? So you can't, for example, even if you're muscularly recovered, you know, deadlift 48 hours after squatting. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and about kind of how you planned out your weeks and, and how you'd kind of plan out weeks for, for strength athletes, for example. Yeah, the, the bone takes longer to recover. And if you're on your way up trying to rebuild like I was in gift of injury, you got to take a week off to let that bone heal, at least five days. And uh, let let yourself heal, recover. You still train a little bit, but you're not going to use a bunch of compression and uh, load, you'll do core exercises, you'll walk, you mentioned walks a minute ago, great for the 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 deep core musculature, great attraction in the spine for some people, great way to build capacity, great for your blood sugar, your blood pressure, digestion, for sleep, it's like great for so many different things. So people getting out and walking is like a must. I think it's a must for people. Strength athlete or not, back client or not, getting out and walking a couple times a day, you gotta do it. It's interesting. I, re I remember hearing that from Professor McGill. I, I think he calls it nature's back balm or something like that. So even top strength athletes, you're still prescribing walking. You're still suggesting they walk. Oh, yeah. And it might be shorter bouts of walking for some people, especially if they're really big. But, yeah, walking is like low-hanging fruit for general athleticism, general health, and then back pain. You know, it's, it's low-hanging fruit. It's easy. It makes sense. And it's very accessible for everybody, right? You pretty much, I mean, obviously some yeah. exceptions, but most people can get out and go for a 10, 15 minute walk a couple times a day. But right now, you guys' weather is pretty dismal, isn't it? It's pretty, it's pretty depressing, wet and cold. We're not in, in lovely Jacksonville, Florida. So um, yeah, it's not, it's not much fun. It doesn't get super cold, but it's, um, it's wet. So not, not the most appealing walking weather, but you know, everybody can find 15 minutes, right? When it's not raining. If it's a priority, you'll you'll make time for whatever's a priority in your life. If if I said I, I did Swiss a couple of weeks ago where I did a talk on squatting and back injury, and I used a couple of examples of people I rebuilt, and it's only an hour, so you can only do so much. So I did mostly hands on and kind of talked in between, but yeah, and and by the way, I, I did that in front of Doctor McGill, so I had to like you know talk about all this stuff. A lot of it I learned from him, so. You know, that's kind of difficult to do. And I don't think he would understand that, you know? Yeah, I can imagine that he's a daunting guy to have in the, uh, you know, in the audience there. And congratulations, by the way, I should have led with this on the Lifetime Achievement Award. That's pretty cool. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that, man. Uh, it surprised me when I got it. I wasn't expecting that and not really sure what I did to deserve it. I guess maybe just... Um... I heard you squatted some some heavy weight a couple of times. So yeah, maybe, maybe it's that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, going back to recovery and training splits, it's hard to have a traditional split, especially as you have um, an older lifting age. Biological age, I'm 42, but my lifting age is probably in, my, in the 50s, maybe more, right? I don't have pain. Like, my foot hurts every once in a while, like I said, but, you know, that's it is what it is. Um, with that said, it's easy for people to get caught up in thinking they have to squat on day one, bench on day three, deadlift on day five, and turn around and, and do it all over again. I think optimally for the person that's trying to rebuild or avoid a back injury uh, and just want longevity, going about a training split with a squat and a deadlift on the same day for some people can be very helpful because they don't have to worry about turning around and deadlifting after the squat a couple days later after benching and then turn around and have to squat again just a couple days later. So for some people, they can do they can rotate their heavy squat, their heavy deadlift, and then do heavy squat, light deadlift, light squat, heavy deadlift. And they can just rotate it in and out on their day one. And then they can do all their assistance work and their core work on the other day they would typically deadlift. Um, some people I've used to build resilience is squat, bench, and deadlift on the same day. I talk about this in Gift of Injury and 1020 Life. Jumbo day is what I call it. And that's what I used in 2014. Squat, bench, and deadlift on the same day, then a full week of recovery to build more capacity. 
but I would do a little little bouts of um, core work and GPP work on a couple days throughout the, the next week. Suitcase carry, stir the pot, sled drags, push-ups, pull-ups, that type of thing. And I built capacity where I can see the meat stay demands of squatting, benching, and deadlifting, but I microdosed it and built it up so I could replicate the meat day. It, it makes a lot of sense uh, when you think about it, and especially for you and, and any powerlifters where there's a, a, a very big neurological nervous system demand as well, right? That doesn't just recover in 48 hours either. I can imagine, I mean, I've never had anything close to a thousand pounds on my back, but I can imagine, you know, the, the CNS toll from that is going to be high, right? So that's another reason that you're going to want to leave it, you know, a week or whatever it might be. Yep. Yeah, it's a lot, man. You're, you're wound up. For, for a long time, man, you've uh, you got a lot to recover from. And your, your muscular system, even like your skeletal system, might be recovered, you know, within those, I don't know, a couple of days, up to five days for talking about bone. But, man, sometimes it takes a couple of weeks to recover from a really gut-wrenching deadlift or squat or whatever stressor you have in your life. And this is interesting as well to people i think so you obviously know a lot about coming back from injury and not just necessarily spinal injuries but but other injuries and one thing i've wanted to ask you was what is the what are the kind of main differences you you work with a lot of people right and presumably that they'll recover but if if there are times where people don't recover as well what are the kind of differences right so you must have worked with hundreds of people what are the kind of hallmarks of a successful injury recovery versus people who, who don't have perhaps as much success? Great question. Um, well, there's definitely some patterns with the people that don't get better. And a lot of them are type A personalities that just can't put the bar down. They can't, they're addicted to training. Uh, they might be male, they might be female. They're addicted to training and that's their outlet. They may have poor... Um, poor marital situation or let's just say a, a child with a disability or something. And uh, being at home stresses them out. So they want to go and do CrossFit and they're a cardio and weight training addict and they're, don't, they don't have the configurations to snatch or clean and jerk or overhead squat and they just blow themselves apart. And when you say, hey, you can't go there with all your buddies and train – those are the people that are really hard to get to stop going to CrossFit class and doing the uh, cookie cutter workouts. They're, they're very difficult. So the type A personalities are people that are addicted to the gym, uh, that, that are difficult at some, time, at some points, and they don't give proper time to heal. They're always in a rush. When can I do this? When can I do that? They tinker behind your back and they're asking, you know, Johnny about this. They're asking Brian about this. They're asking Sue about this. Then they'll ask someone from a completely different school of thought. Yes, you know, Josh, go squat or go squat. You're fine. You know, the pain's in your head. Go stretch your hamstrings. Stretch out your your piriformis. The next thing you know, they got all these crazy symptoms, and they're not being honest with you. That's another thing. A lack of honesty sometimes, where people won't tell you, "Hey, I'm hurting again. I shouldn't be doing the things that you're having me do because I'm not honest with you." A big reason is people don't give it adequate time. That's why they don't get better. And as you said, it's, it's almost stimulus addicts or, or being addicted to, I understand people will, will exercise for their mental health, but I suppose the question as well is, you know, are you exercising mainly for mental health or are you exercising mainly to increase your physical performance? And as you said, get out of pain and, and all that sort of thing. You got to change the mentality for it because – the people that are trying to get the outlet mentally are destroying their body, even though they think they're doing better and they may be doing better from a psychological standpoint. Those people, it's really hard to get them because what they'll say is, I'll get depressed. I'll get bipolar, I'll go into bipolar. I'll do this, I'll do that. And even some really famous people that I've consulted um, that are in the movies and they're, you know, like all that you would, you'd see them everywhere. They're known for their athleticism. They're like, I'm a training addict, and if I don't train, I get really depressed. And then, you know, I start having problems in my marriage. I start having problems with my work. And then, so they have to keep, they have to keep training. 
those people are very difficult to get on board because they might have, you know, the season starting up in two months and they don't want to rest because they're scared. Uh, they won't be in good enough shape, but availability supersedes ability. So these people may be decondition deconditioned a little bit, but the good news is they're in one piece. So we can make up for a little bit of conditioning, but if you're hurt and in great shape, it doesn't even matter. So there, there are quite a few things I think that's so valuable for people to hear, especially from someone like you who has the credibility to say it. But there's so many things that I want to pick up on there. Um, I suppose the first, as you said, is like the, the best ability is often availability, right? So I think that's important for people to remember. If you can't even make it to the meet, you can't even make it to the season, then it doesn't matter what you've done before, right? That's what there, – there are two things. So – the first thing you've, you've talked about the difference between training and competing. And you've also talked about how like the way in which you prepare is going to like, you want to deload before disaster is what I had in my head, right? You almost want to come in a little undercooked rather than I was wondering, you know, it's going to be more persuasive and, and more powerful if you talk about it, but how you approach um, if you're training someone for a big sporting event, it may be a powerlifting meet, it may be strongman, it may be, you know, the CrossFit Games, I don't know, whatever it might be. How, how do you kind of explain the mentality for, for that? Uh, pick your battles. Each training, don't be training day, don't be uh, scared to walk away from a training day. Always leave something in the tank. Um, more, that's, you know, I don't want to be too rigid with that, but as a general rule of thumb, always leave something in the tank except for the days you got to push near failure if you're testing something, you know. But as I said earlier about um, the Green Beret test for the sit-ups, we won't, we won't, we'll definitely leave some sit-ups in the tank. We'll, we'll do it 50% there, but we'll blow the crap out of stir the pot in side planks for five minutes, you know what I mean? And reverse planks on the uh, back extension machine for minutes at a time. And so their core is, Man, it's ready to go. But here's the thing with them. The reason why, other than it's a mechanism of injury for a lot of these uh, special forces and SEALs, the flexion under load, which is the sit up like super fast, crushing over and over, they got to be able to ruck with 120 pounds sometimes. The Green Berets have to carry um, 420 rounds of 223 in their sack. And that's what they have to carry. Then they have to fit everything in the best they can with their food and supplies. It's 120 pounds they have to carry for 10 miles and just Robin Sage of the Q course, which is like the latter part where they kind of really test you on all things. And you've got to have a spine that can bend a bit, but it's definitely going to have to be able to bear that compressive load when they're sometimes running for 10 miles. They're not, they're not running like 10 miles an hour or anything or 20 miles an hour, but they're like a fast, like, speed walking at five or six miles an hour probably sometimes and that's brutal on the spine yeah that's like having a small person on your back right for, for all that all that time and you're in boots and you're in the mud and it's just it, it, you got to get them uh resilient so you have to dance around things like that and get creative with something like the sit-up test because along with the sit-up test they have another goofy test which is a trap bar sitting on the shoelaces. So it's a rounded back starter and they have to pull, you know, 300 pounds or so like picking up their heaviest beret out of, you know, whatever it is. So yeah, they set up and that suckers, you know, right on top of the shoelaces. So most people can't get in a good position with the, uh, the bar that low sitting on the ground, basically. And that's kind of ridiculous, but I get, you know, that I'm not an expert army special forces. So, you know, I gotta. I don't make the policies. So, but as you said, that there, there are ways to train for the test. There's a big difference between training and testing. There are ways to train for the test, which means you'll ace the test without having to necessarily always just kind of repeat what you're going to do for the test, right? As you said. Yep. Yep. Be prepared, and some people will need a little bit more competition or spec form. Some uh, won't need very much at all, and and. and that's why you have to dial in that custom approach for that unique goal and where the deficits are, where the strengths are and kind of meeting in the middle and putting together a good program. 
because you also have to have endurance with these guys, you know, not just ruck endurance, but be able to run for a long time and on very little food and sleep. So you got to get their cardio in. They got to run. And so that's not necessarily uh, conducive for the setups and the rucking as far as being the best at those two things. So it's a man, they got to almost like a CrossFitter. They got to be good at everything, but you got to be careful the way you train when you're trying to mix up all these different things because there's a reason why I see a lot of them for their back is because during selection, when they're being pushed to their physical limits, they they blow out a lot of the time. It must be, I, I suppose it would be say, similar for like UFC fighters and those kind of guys who, because they obviously have to have that that rigidity, but then significant element of like flexibility and, and all those sorts of things as well. And as you said, that presents kind of different challenges from a strength athlete, for example. Very much different. UFC athletes, very dynamic. And I have a couple that I work with and man, they're such freak athletes because they have to be explosive and endurable. They have to be strong, but flexible. And uh, yeah, man, you got to kind of pick your battles with what you want to run with, you know, your Vitor Belfort style that you're, you're not going to beat many people in a five rounder, but you're going to knock out a lot of people in the first two rounds. Um, What's your style, man. And then you got to train to cater to that style. If you're an endurable guy, like a, a Nate Diaz that will fight for 10 rounds if he could. That's endurance is his bread and butter, man. So that's something that, uh, you know, you, you maybe want to train his strength and explosiveness a little bit more, and but still not go away from his strengths either. So the UFC fighters are very, uh, they're across the board different. Some are like hardcore fighters that grew up rough. Some of them are, you know, grew up in Laguna Beach, California, uh, parents are millionaire billionaires and they just like to fight you know the other people don't like to fight their athletes like a george st pierre they don't like to fight they're terrified of it they're just a supreme machine and they can just beat up other machines but they don't enjoy it they're not like a mike perry that loves just brawling right mike perry those styles you know don fry you know those old school types they just like to brawl you know George St. Pierre hates it. He talked about how he was trying to disappear every fight. Yeah, it's as you said, but he was the consummate athlete, right? And he was just, those athletic abilities were able to, you know, allowed him to do things that, that other people couldn't necessarily do, especially at that weight class. Yep, a freak of nature and had the brain to go with his body. And uh, then you have one of the greatest of all time. So before we talk about kind of changing gears and before we talk about recovery, which is something uh, we've kind of mentioned and, and spoken around a little bit, I was, I'd love to get your perspective on something about this. We see it a lot online, this idea of the kind of, and you put a YouTube video uh, out about this, which is why I'm asking, but the, this idea of this outwork mentality, right? And the kind of nature and nurture, and it, it's super interesting to hear your perspective. One, because you know you're a world record holder, and and two, just because you work with so many athletes, so you've kind of seen it from from both sides. And I'd love to say, if, yeah, just your thoughts on this sort of mentality and and the sort of nature nurture debate. I'd love to hear. Well, I think the. The majority of the people that I see and work with, they do too much. And, and it's not unusual. I can count on one hand how many times I have told one of these athletes, you're doing too much or you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough, man. Never does that happen, honestly. Maybe a couple times if it's not even a top athlete, though. They're usually lethargic B personality that you tell them to do five, they'll do two and a half. But... Most people think they need all this crazy training volume, and if they don't use it, they'll lose it, and all these euphemisms you know, out there that, that people think are, are true. You know, you're going to waste away all your muscle you know, if you don't train for a month. And yeah, you might catabolize a little bit of muscle, but you're losing glycogen. You're not just atrophying your muscle sideways unless you have HIV and you're not eating or something like that, right? Or you're a cancer patient. You're not, yeah, I, I get that, but man – People think that they have to train all the time to maintain. They're scared they won't get better from a physical standpoint if their backs hurt or better at the lift if they don't train it all the time. And that's half the battle. But, man, people just do too much. They do too much volume, too often, too much frequency. And then 
I don't know what that is, but that's pretty cool. Um, did you see that? No, I don't know what that is either, but we, we can edit that out. I don't know. It's uh, I haven't seen that before. Too much intensity. They train too heavy too often. Too much volume. And they just beat they get you get strong doing this type of a program. I did it in high school where I benched three or four times a week. I got really strong to three fifteen and then all of a sudden I couldn't handle it anymore. Yeah, there's a ceiling to that, right? As you said, that that might work initially, but like anything, it's I suppose it's it's, you know, more isn't better, better is better, right? Quality over quantity and all that sort of thing is especially in, in what you're talking about with kind of the higher level athletes, right? People watch my YouTube videos and they've gotten more popular and that's great. But then people will email me, Brian at PowerXStrength.com. I'll put it like on YouTube and stuff like email me or reach out for a consult on PowerXStrength. And they'll be like, Brian, I can't quite put together the program from your videos. And I'm like, that's not the purpose. The purpose is giving you information to start your own pursuit, right? So a lot of the time people email me and I'm like, you got to start doing some homework. You got to read some books. You might need to pay someone for a consult, but I don't know what the effective dose is going to be. And if I were to answer you in the comments or in just the email, um, I'd be doing you a disservice because I know nothing about your athletic history. I don't know wh what your back pain is. Is it shooting? Is it tingling? Is it numb? Is it burning? Is it dull and achy? Like what, what is it? We have to have a, a dialogue back and forth. I need to see a move. I need to see a lift. Then I can give you a legitimate answer. But these people are expecting to be able to put their whole program together just by gleaning an article or a video or listening to a podcast that, that isn't going to happen. So people, everyone's unique dosage will be unique to that person, but it's always nice to start with something less and then use the least effective dose to build up over time. So if five is great, why are you doing nine? It makes a lot of sense. And especially from something I want to talk about a little bit later, but from a longevity perspective, right? There's only so much like where you're going to have in your knees and your elbows and your shoulders and why would you do more than the minimum effective dose, right? Everything has a, a biological cost, if you like. Why, you know, if you can get the same results or even better results with a little bit less volume, why would you put your body through the extra stress? It makes so much sense when you say it and your reasons, but I guess it's hard for people, you know, stimulus addicts we've talked about, but it's hard for people to, to kind of comprehend unless you have someone like you who's like, okay, well, he has the credibility and the like academic ability to kind of tell me what to do. A lot of people left to their own devices, as you said, will piece it together and kind of get it wrong or, or try and do everything in everybody's method. You're like, no, you need to pick one and like follow that expert advice. That's very well said. You, uh, you summed it up. Well, people, um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll sometimes rebut, respond with um when they say you know I, I i do this amount i'm like well why are you doing so much i, I don't know I'm like, well if you're doing a diet i, I don't think sustainable uh, a sustainable diet would be eating as much as possible every single day would it be no i mean you can do that for a little bit but then what won't you start how much how many calories are you eating now i don't know well okay we'll track that first of all then see what your weight's doing. You're trying to add weight. I can't get bigger and I've been eating everything I can. Okay, well, you're at 2750 now, calories. Go to 3000. What do you do? Nothing still. Go to 3250. Go to 4000. Don't just go to 10,000, something you're not going to be able to maintain, something that's going to end up killing you. It's not sustainable. It just doesn't make any sense. So when I explain it to them like that, they're like, oh, okay. Well, I guess training has limits too, and there's a sweet spot. So that makes sense. Yeah. And I think. Again, we, we've kind of segued into it, but you don't want to do any more than is necessary, right? Especially from a recovery perspective, because it's just going to be harder to recover from without any further, you know, performance, whatever it might be, health gains. So I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit about kind of how you think about recovery and then more kind of emerging uh, products like, like CBD, for example, those kind of things. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. So during my... During my time as a power lifter, I, I, I didn't take a ton of supplements. Now, I experimented and dabbled. I'd drink protein shakes. 
I would take some creatine every once in a while. I would take some, uh, you know, vitamin B3, B6, B12, magnesium, calcium, potassium. But none of these things necessarily were big staples in my training consistently other than like just making sure I get enough sodium. That was one big thing, staying hydrated, enough sodium. Um, that was one consistent thing. When I was recovering, I really didn't take any extra, I might've taken a little extra magnesium and calcium, but I didn't use any of the experimental drugs. I didn't do any stem cells, didn't do any PRP, didn't do any peptides. Uh, the only thing that I got into was cannabis. So I started using uh, various forms of CBD and THC. And uh, I think that helped me with my sleep. It helped me with my recovery. You know, the science isn't hard on it. There's a lot of, well, it's actually, it, it, it is hard on it because it shows that it's pretty much anecdotal is what it looks like or placebo. But I know just looking at my dog that I give my CBD to, you know, my own CBD brand and seeing him come off the narcotics that the vet gave him and him falling over and passing out and all this stuff to him being up and happy and walking around. I see it work. I've seen it work for me, but I started experimenting with cannabis in 2013. So 10 years ago, and that's when I started uh, using THC, CBD, and then I got really into CBD the last five years. And that's when I started working on developing my own formula with one of my friends from high school, Kristen, that's been in cannabis for 10 years. And we just kind of started working together, started dialing in some formulas for a, a roller product called CryoFreeze. It's menthol and CBD together, and you roll it on like a BioFreeze. We have a balm and a few different scents, lavender sage, lemongrass, natural. You can put that on to sore muscle a few times a day, um, kind of like an ibuprofen effect. And then some lingual drops to wow. help you with sleep, relaxing. And we have gummies, which everyone likes, which basically mimic the <laughs> sublingual system. You know, you, you, you digest it and take it uh, systemically. But yeah. I've noticed that a lot of people do well, man. It can take the edge off their knee pain. Um, different people respond in different ways to medication. So for some people, an opiate will make them throw up. The other person, an opiate will make them bounce off the walls and feel like a million bucks. So those are the people that get addicted yeah. to them. CBD is kind of the same way with your cannabinoid receptors. Some people just don't respond to it. They don't get a good effect from it. Other people are like, oh my God, I can quit every medicine I've ever taken. I don't need it. I just need CBD. So we found some people that are hyper responders and some people that don't really respond well. One key thing about our CBD is we use CBD isolate. So we derive it from hemp and there's no THC on our plant. So cops, fire, police, all those People don't have to worry about failing a drug test potentially. Now we pay more for CBD isolate, but it's a higher quality. Yeah, I think that's a big concern for CBD for a lot of people. You know, failing the the drug test and popping for you know with the THC. But it's good to see that things have evolved from like the horse liniment and that kind of thing, right? That there's products that are actually you know designed with with a lot more kind of evidence base i guess yeah, horse um, liniment. <laughs> well I, people used to when i played rugby we used to use it i mean it's it's that kind of uh that kind of mentality i guess yeah um equi but equi sorry was the one that we yeah i i've heard of that yeah it's it's interesting i mean and i think with a lot of this is is dosage you know dosage as well right the the dosages have to be especially for a cbd product they right? have to be uh you have to take quite a bit of cbd we suggest like 20 to 40 milligram range but a lot of these products if you look at them they're full of broad spectrum and you, you, it'll have 700 milligrams of hemp or cbd and other products but it won't be all cbd to be mixed with other cannabinoids we only use isolate, so you're getting the most CBD out of it. It's not a, a watered-down version like some of the broader full-spectrum products out there. But, man, a police officer, a fireman fell in a drug test is a career ender. So that's why we don't take any chances and have testing actually on our website that show the different batches and show there's zero. We can have point up to 0.3% THC and still be legal, but we have none. That's I think that's probably comforting for a lot of people, right? I had a few people get drug tested while taking it, and they put, they were good, thankfully. Yeah, 
That's uh, well, that's a that's a good endorsement for sure. Um, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about kind of your approach to nutrition as well. So I think it's interesting going back to your powerlifting days. The fact that you started competing at a lower a lower weight, right, two twenty, which is which is close to my weight, and then you know you, you competed at, is is a two forty two and then two seventy five and then just. 308 right so that's that's hugely that's almost 100 pounds heavier right so i was just wondering about like interested to hear about your your power lifting you know what you did then and also you know what you what you advocate now so maybe start with what you know your thoughts on nutrition back then i i didn't really eat clean i just ate enough so when i did my first bench meet in 99 i probably I was in the 181 weight class in the 98 and then when i started getting into full meets 220 and all the way up to 308 i didn't compete in the uh, super heavyweight class ever. But what I would do is just eat according to what I was trying to do. So if, when I would cut down to 220, I would eat less calories, do more cardio, less junk food. Um, when I'd go up, I'd eat more overall calories during my meals, maybe a little bit more junk food, maybe a little bit less cardio. Um, but I just stuck with staples. I, I, I stayed with staples. Steak, chicken, rice, potatoes, pasta, and then when I was in the bigger weight classes, I could eat a little bit uh, less rigid, where if I wanted to go out to eat and eat sushi more or Japanese, I would do that. But really, I, I based my nutrition around similar to the vertical diet, and that's kind of what I do now. I eat a lot of beef and rice and that kind of stuff. But back then, it was uh, move up a weight class with more junk food and more calories overall, and then more cardio, less junk food initially, and then less calories as I needed to come down and slide into that weight class. But I think that uh, food is a, is a tool for gaining weight and uh, you eat too much of even good food, you're going to be unhealthy potentially. And you can eat a crappy McDonald's diet and stay under 2000 calories and not everyone, but there's a great deal of people that are just going to be fine doing that. But it's, uh, you know, I think it's about calorie intake and uh, of course sources matter for the way you're going to feel. But uh, yeah, man, I like steak and chicken and uh, rice and potatoes and eggs, grits, you know, just the simple, simple stuff like that. And uh, the vertical diet is uh, a, a simplified way of just kind of following that. Stan, Stan Effeting, right? Shout, shout out to him in, in, in that vertical diet. So there's a, there's a story I'd like to, like to hear you tell, which I think explains a lot about mental strength and mentality and resilience as well as it's relevant to what we've just been talking about so obviously for for 220 for example you're you're by most people's standards i know not for powerlifting but like a, a pretty big guy so getting down to like 220 or getting down to whatever it might be you might in some cases drop like 20 pounds in a, in a short period of time so i think it was the 2006 senior nationals or, or something like that but where you had to travel and I'll let you take, take the story from, from here. But um, I think that that explains a lot of good lessons in a very memorable way. Yeah. So 2006 senior nationals in Vegas, I live in Jacksonville, Florida, and we got a goofy reroute from whoever we were flying with at the time. And basically I got stuck in an airport in uh, Pittsburgh and then because our flight got canceled and I was cutting 25 pounds during this time. And we had to get rerouted to, to D.C., then drove to Baltimore, stayed in the hotel for a couple hours. And we were going to take off at 6 in the morning from Baltimore, so I didn't get any sleep. And all during this time, my scale was locked in my uh, my checked luggage. So I had no idea what I was weighing, but I was taking my Lasix and, and all this stuff. And uh, yeah, this whole time, I was fighting the uh, urge to shut down and just go to Burger King or McDonald's and eat. But... Man, I, I built a lot of mental toughness during that time, just grinning and bearing it. You know, I still had a six-hour flight across, you know, the states um, to do the next morning to get to, to Vegas. And, man, that flight was delayed, too. And I had to run to the scale and spit in the sink. And I jumped on the, the scale, and I was just about a half a pound over or so. So I went and spit the rest out and went and weighed in. But I almost missed weigh-ins. About 30 minutes later, I had missed weigh-ins and not been able to weigh in until – that evening and that would have screwed everything up for the meat. But during that time, I realized I could endure a lot more than I thought because I just didn't give myself a choice. 
I wasn't going to go succumb until I missed weigh-in. Then I was going to go ahead and eat. But I didn't miss weigh-in, and thankfully, I had uh, a really good total that day. And it just basically made me feel like I had nothing to lose. By making it to the meet and weighing in and having a good rehydrate, had a day to recover, it basically gave me confidence. Like, hey, I have nothing to lose. Let's go and have some fun because uh, there's a good chance I almost didn't make it here. So let's just have fun. And I guess it, it probably gave you confidence in that, you know, you can cope with a lot more, right? If you could deal with all that difficulty and still perform at a high level, you know, uh, that, you know, dealing with these difficult situations would help in, in future, right? Because things don't always go to plan, especially in, you know, when you're cutting weight. Yeah, it helped my patience. It helped me to stay to, true to the plan. And uh, man, I was so thirsty on that flight because I was been taking Lasix, not drinking any water and you know, it's different. If I'd have been already in Vegas, like I should have been the night before, I'd be in a comfy, cold hotel room with my feet up. I'd be, instead of sitting on a hot plane, you know, stressed, I'd already be in my room. So that was, when I made it through that, I realized that no matter what, my body's going to tell me I'm, my mind's going to tell me I'm done way before my body does. So ignore that. But that can be dangerous too, you know, because I was very dehydrated and, you know, bad things can happen when you're that dehydrated. So yeah i mean i guess it just shows that you're able to kind of or you were able and still if you wanted to but to push your body and to kind of mind over matter like mentally you know once you'd mentally locked in on something then the body went where where the you know where the mind told it to go the same mindset to stay on track with the big three while everyone was making fun of me exactly yeah well you're doing a seal pilates i love that i am um, so Going back and a couple of things that I wanted to kind of ask you a little bit more about just to get your opinion on, because, you know, it's not every day I get to speak to a world record holder. So it's pretty cool to get your opinion on on things. So people are interested in extremes, right? People are interested in world record squats. It's not that entertaining to watch someone squat 600 pounds, right? Because there are, I mean, quite a few people who can do that. Right, people want to see the hundred meters. They want to see some guy run it in seven seconds, and and that sort of thing, right? So, I'd love to get your take on things like performance enhancing drugs, things like other enhancements. You know, anything along those lines. Uh, what what do people kind of perhaps not realize, or people don't think about when the pursuit of these extremes? Right, you're by definition pushing your body or pushing, you know, someone's pushing their body to do something that no human being has ever done. Squat 1306 pounds, you know, whatever it might be. I was wondering how do people who are actually pushing the limits, people like you, think about these things? Well, if, if let me start off by saying this. If I were to give advice to someone that were considering performance enhancing drugs or, or whatever it is to them, whatever that means to them, it's what you're getting into. Yeah. And, and that isn't me cautioning anyone. I, mean, I guess you should have caution with anything you take, right? But isn't like it's not a warning. It's just just be aware. Be cognizant of the potential side effects. It can affect your brain. It can affect uh, you know, from a you from a phys physiological, from a psychological standpoint. And um just know what you're getting into. But I'm all for people taking whatever it is they want to take, and but they just have to be okay with the consequences. What's the consequence? I, I don't know. For some people, they're not going to have seemingly any consequences. Other people, stroke, heart attack, an abscess, get septic. I, I don't know, but there's a lot of different things. Um, just know what you're getting yourself into, and uh, there's going to be a price to pay, and it might be something seemingly small like... Um, your blood pressure going up and taxing your kidneys or you losing your fertility like I did and had to, you know, re refigure that out. And I did luckily. I'm actually doing it again now. I'm, I'm off my HRT and taking my HCG and clomid and everything. But I'm all for not testing. Let each person take what they want to take. But at the same time, each person has to accept their consequences. And I think there are ways to take performance enhancing drugs an example, steroids and growth hormones and their 
cousins and sisters. I think there are ways for some people to take those with minimal repercussions long term. But there's too many variables there to say it's safe for everyone because they might have tumors that go crazy on them and cancer and who knows they they might have uh, kidney issues already and they finish them off or liver issues or heart you know blood pressure i don't know but for some people they can do it for until they're in their 70s or 80s and i see these people other people they do one cycle in their 20s of uh test and halotestin or something all their hair falls out they have huge cystic uh, androgenic induced acne all over their back, which hurts where they have to go in and lance them and they scar real bad. Like I've seen some really effed up acne on people before. I'm like, what? They're like, it's all abscessed. And just from doing a cycle of, uh, Winstrol or something. So everyone's going to respond differently, similar to like the opiates and the CBD. Know what you're getting yourself into. Start with the least effective dose and, uh, start off with some testosterone you know, if I were talking to myself 20 years ago, start off with a little bit of testosterone, add in a little bit of a D-ball maybe at 20 to 40 milligrams. And then, you know, I went right to trend, but do some Anadrol for a bit, maybe some Deca. But that's what I did try. I started off with a little test, a little Diana ball, a little Anadrol, and then went right to trend. And I pretty much stayed in that uh, realm for a while, doing some Deca and some EQ instead of the trend periodically some Anavar, but I um, I started with 250 a week of test. Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting to people because often the top guys, you know, I think of you, I think of Dorian Yates, you know, are not taking perhaps the dosages that, that people might think, right? And it, as you said, it's, it's all about minimum effective dose. It's all about being smart. It's all about monitoring your health monitor you know getting proper supervision all these kinds of things that will make a big difference yeah getting blood work done is, is some advice i'd give to someone but they're gonna have to figure out all those details on there and they need to figure out what's going to work for them and how much they want to commit to it some people don't get blood work they don't have a doctor follow up and they're fine other people croak so i i i, I can't really say like how all in they should be with their health but i i wasn't all in with my health but i am i am now um, the amateurs, a lot of the time, amateur bodybuilders, powerlifters, a lot of those guys are truly taking mega doses because they don't know better and they're just doing, they don't care. They'll do anything to become Dorian Yates or whoever. Those are the people that are taking five grams of test a week. And they're, they're people that I've talked to that have taken five grams of test a week, two grams of DECA, you know, a gram or two of trend. 400 milligrams of anadrol a day. I mean, they've ran the doses up pretty crazy and they had serious repercussions, some of them. My sweet spot for my dosages, the one I ran for 1306, because I could be bigger, so no trend, no Masteron, no Winstrol. I did that for the 242 ride for a while and it kept my body weight lower. Did probe instead of sip or an anthate, just bloated less. 1,000 milligrams of test. 600 EQ, 400 DECA, a little bit of Anadrol and D-Ball sprinkled throughout the day, just a couple milligrams at a time. That was like what I went into squatting 1306. And I felt great, but I could never take those drugs before because I get too big and my body didn't feel good so big. But after coming off in 19 and rebuilding and then jumping up to 308, I mean, I felt good heavier, so I just rode with it. But for... You know, years after seeing McGill, five years after seeing McGill, my back did not feel good whenever I got over 270. My back didn't hurt, but I knew that I didn't feel right. I felt tight, you know? It's and it, But it's interesting that you were able to do something for this specific task, right, and then back off. Like, it was very targeted and systematic, and I think that's important for people to remember. Um the other thing that I wanted to kind of talk about is this idea of like in some sports, for example, your sport, it may well be, and this is worth flagging up, that like putting that kind of weight on your back has inherent risks, right? That some people would say kind of puts the performance enhancing drug use into perspective. People are so worried about the dangers of that, but 
thirteen hundred pounds on your back, as you said, anything could happen. Especially because nobody had done it before, right? So by definition, we don't know what happened. What we do now, but like we wouldn't know. It's it's. In, do you see what I mean? It's a very interesting thing. Yeah, I was thinking that. You know, I I knew full well that there's potential for me exploding underneath it, and you know, the human limit is just under thirteen, or it was just my limit, my physiological capacity, my skeletal system, or whatever it is. It was like nope. And it, I felt it in my feet for sure when I picked up the weight, and it felt, definitely felt, uh, felt it, it was heavy, but it felt manageable. It felt manageable, and I think it's because I just amped myself up so much for the lift. I was peaked. I didn't cut weight. I built a core of iron with doing all the things I preach about, suitcase carries, stir the pot, big three, some good mornings, you know, some seated, good, uh, not seated, but uh, pin good mornings with the bar here with the flat back and uh, extending up with it. Just different things like that that I did. And uh, I was well prepared for any weight. And I did a lot of volume on my belt squat so I can build up the quad strength and endurance and put some size on there without having to put, I don't know, five or 600 pounds on my back with the bar and get that same amount of volume and effect on the legs. So the, the belt squat was a big help for that. But man, I just built a lot of confidence going into that. And uh, it all kind of formed to a peak that weekend where I just wanted to put all my cards on the table and kind of see where I stood and then be good with how they all fell. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's good that you went in with that mentality, right? I think that that was so important. And you're probably the first person in history to say, well, you, you almost are certainly the first person in history to say 1,306 pounds. It felt manageable, you know? That was, uh, that's amazing. And I think this neatly kind of segues onto what's your training like now? So I, the first thing I wanted to ask is, how did you feel like the week, two weeks after that 1,306 squat? And then- you know, what's your training like now? What's what's everything like now? So we'll come to that in a sec. But like, how was the recovery? How did you feel afterwards? I felt fine. My back wasn't even sore the next day. We drove 10 hours home the next day. And then Monday wow. I had pre-op. So Saturday meet, Sunday drive home, Monday pre-op. Tuesday I had surgery on my, I evulsed my bicep a month before that competition. And I kind of kept it to myself. But that's why I wasn't benching or deadlifting that day. Uh, but I had surgery, but man, my, my body was fine. Uh, the drive back, no back pain, but between the, the lifting and the drive and the surgery, I just chilled out for a week or so. So I was fine. You know, I just kind of, I was amazing. fine after yeah. the squat and I just hung out and helped the rest of the people. And I felt fine. I, I wasn't even like really discolored or anything. It was kind of weird. I felt like I, I'm so used to doing another six lifts after the squat. It was easy just to do that and just shut it down. Um, yeah, so I was actually, uh, pretty good. My training now is very uh, lackluster and boring, and I'm just trying to maintain athleticism, but it's very hard staying motivated mm -hmm. in training without a specific number of goal because I did that for 20 years straight. That before, before we go into that, and I'd love to hear more about that in a second, this might be a very frustrating question, but I don't know whether you've been asked this before, but... Did you, if it felt manageable, did you feel like you may have had more? Yeah, I was texting with one of my buddies, uh, Bird, earlier, and I sent him a video of it because we're building that documentary, 1306, Gift of Injury. And um, he's like, man, if you could have just managed the unrack, you'd have been able to uh, do probably 1340 that day, is what he thought. But yeah, there, there's probably more, but better to leave something in the tank, as I say. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that you actually did it, it'd be better to, you know, as you said, success rather than pushing for more and then, you know, not quite. And then you'd have the other regret, right? Oh, if I'd just gone 1306, I could have, you know, got that it. Too. I don't, I don't agree. So, yeah. Yeah. I think so much of this comes down to like that mental discipline that you've clearly got. But I guess in some ways it works and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it kind of works against you being that so goal focused because now, for example, you're not trying to set a world record, right? You're, you know, you have other priorities. You have, you have a wife, you have a family, right? So your, your priority shifts. And you said it's actually difficult to get motivated to, to train sometimes, for example, when, 
you don't have this like this burning drive to do something that nobody else has done. So yeah, to tell me a little bit about is it all I, and I love your phrase again, is it all like fluff and buff type type training now? Like what do you do? Do you still squat heavy? And obviously that's a relative term. Heavy for me is like 500 pounds to be clear, right? It's not it's not four digits. I got you. Um so right now it, it's it's been a it's been a interesting transition because it's hard for me to get motivated to train a lot of it's fluff and buff right now but to add to the weirdness of walking away from something i did for 20 plus years straight that was the covid year 2020 we had the crazy stuff going on in the united states covid and then i became a dad so there's a lot of everyone's home right it's just it was a weird year for me to become a dad and quit powerlifting, right? That was a, that was two big shakeups. So it's been an adjustment because now I'm not completely focused on building a core of iron or building a big bench or squat or deadlift or total. Now it's hard for me to go out there and say, okay, well, what do I want to do? Now, my goal is to get smaller, leaner. I'm walking a lot. I'm training lighter. But it's hard to get motivated because to get lighter, I have to eat foods uh, that I don't necessarily like all the time. And I can't eat a lot of the foods I want to eat that I ate for 20 years, right? Because I'll just gain weight or at, at the very best, which is still not good, is I'll just retain the muscle. I want I need to lose some of the muscle I have. I'm not all muscle. I have body fat on me, but it's not like I'm, you know, like 30% body fat or something. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. I can lose some weight, but I'm not morbidly obese. And so, that's hard because I don't have these health markers that are saying, you know, get light now or you're going to die. So I'm trying to beat that, but it's hard to be motivated. And, uh, you know, the big changes over the last three years, I'm still dialing it in, but I don't really lift heavy. It's more of a fluff and buff. I'll train with the guys that I train with. And uh, if they go a little heavier on the deadlift, like four or five, 600 pounds, I'll do that. But I don't push the squat or the bench very heavy. And I'm, I'm just kind of good with doing that. And I want to slowly be, I took my weight down from 303 to 280. So I'm a 275, need to be 265, 50, 40. But that's going to be the, the the main focus for me over the next couple of years is getting smaller, more cardiovascular resilience and uh, just kind of detuning the machine a bit. Yeah. Uh, as you said, you're like a, a sports car that's specifically tuned for a specific event, right? Like Formula One or, or in the US, like NASCAR or whatever it might be, right? So, I mean, what, what's the sort of end goal? Like, if you don't mind me asking, like, what's your weight now? And like, how, you know, do you have like an end goal in mind in terms of like a number? Well, I weigh about 275 right now. And so I'd like to get where I'm like 235, but that's going to be, I'm going to have to get lean for that. I'm going to have to lose, lose some muscle. And, um, yeah, I need to cut off the body fat, but it's going to be hard to, to, you know, without a lot of work getting down that low. But I think it would be good for me to get down around the 225 or 230 mark. But I haven't been down. I've been 242 in the last five years, but that was after a water cut and everything, you know? Yeah. That's the goal. And be I have to for my kids. It needs to be the focal point. I need to have that shift in my brain, and I've been working on that. Shift it from that mindset of ultimate strength. Now we need like ultimate like life endurance and resilience. What what I need, and I can still live vicariously through the clients that I work with. You know, I've got one client in particular, Naomi Shepard, who's got a, a five seventy seven squat. She's from the UK at one forty eight and just knee wraps and I'm rebuilding her and helping her with that. But so I can live vicariously through her and, and just help as many people as possible helps also too, with being away from powerlifting. And that's the focus, you know, as I was saying earlier, the, the significant, significant majority of my clients are not necessarily like famous people or top athletes. A lot of them are just average weekend warriors that uh, sought out someone like myself because they've been through the medical system, they failed over and over, and they want someone that not only has lifted before, but's had back pain, and then uh, seen me come out on the other side and knows that I'm certified. So 
I love working with people like that where you just show them a couple things they don't know on the squat and it's a game changer for them. You know, that, that's I really enjoy working with all people, but especially that person that uh, doesn't have a big athletic background that struggles. There's there's one thing, actually, and this just reminded me, and I perhaps should have asked you this earlier when we were talking more about training, but this has come up with a couple of people. I spoke to a strong man, also called Brian, a guy called Brian Alsru, and one thing that, that a lot of people have mentioned and that you've mentioned, but you talk about it in a unique way, is the brace, right? And how you talked about having like different levels of brace. Like if you're picking up a 50-pound bag of dog food, that's clearly still need to brace. And for most people, you know, that requires quite a significant brace. Obviously nothing like squatting 1,306 pounds. But I was wondering, so you put out a really good video that I think people should watch uh, and that helps a lot of people, but how to brace properly. And and again, I don't want to take this out of your mouth, so I think it'd be better if you explain. But um, yeah, talk a little bit about bracing and about how you brace and the different types of brace or the different kind of Level. Yeah, so tuning the brace depending on what the demands are and, and how heavy, fish and all those things. So people think uh, drawing in the belly button, drawing in, activating TA, putting the belly button on the spine. Instead, the way we cue it is we put our fingers in our internal, external obliques and push out laterally. So we tune that brace depending on what we're doing. But then also we use a peck and lat post and strategy of an anti-shrug to create a little bit of stability and stiffness that way as well. And I teach people, especially when I'm rebuilding them, to tune the brace for the demands of your spine hygiene, putting dollars in your bank account. Instead of using up all your dollars in your bank account to move each day, save those for when you want to get back under the bar instead of moving sloppy. Just with the brace, uh, a couple of things that you said that were super interesting is, is out, not in. Right. And and that makes a lot of sense just from a logical perspective, because like a wider pillar is probably going to be a stronger pillar, right? Rather than sucking it. In. Exactly. Like yeah, more more kind of distribution. And then I think the the exa- the way you phrased it is a really good way to phrase it. Like your day to day activities, right? Thinking thinking about it like a checking account. So like if you're if you're if you're debiting when you're like picking something off the floor or like debiting when you're you know sitting in your chair watching TV then when you come to do a big debit like you know buying a car when you're squatting you know to to keep with that same metaphor yeah i was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about that i think cuz i think that appeals to a lot of people cuz they can understand you know financial terms yeah so build up your your account so when you want to go and and lift in the gym you can utilize those those dollars to make the, the, the purchase you, that you are more interested in or what your goals are instead of using it up, doing things that are no benefit to you. You don't enjoy doing them. So move well, create that good engram of using your hips and your knees and stiffening your core, tuning the dimmer switch, the brace, and put those dollars in your bank account. Don't use up your athleticism all day by the way you move, sitting sloppy, plopping on the floor, all these different things, and then expect to uh, be able to, after time, squat pain-free later that day. Put dollars in your bank account and be able to do that. I think that's a great way of putting it, um, and I think that, that that explains it really well um, for a lot of people in, in terms that they can kind of readily understand. So I'm conscious we've spoken for a long time, and I, you've been very generous with your time, and I, I want to be respectful of it. So just a couple of things to wrap up. So you've mentioned that you have this documentary. We've talked about The Gift of Injury, the book that you co-authored with Professor McGill. 1020 Life is is another book that you've written. Uh, We've talked a little bit about the the consulting and the fact that, you know, that you spend most of your professional life now, you know, helping people with back injuries as, as a McGill provider. How can people kind of get in touch with you where would you where would you send them if they want to learn a bit more about you all those sorts of things before the documentary comes out yeah so you could find me at power powerrackstrength.com and that's where i uh have my content uh videos from youtube on there and uh place where you can book virtual consulting i do both virtual and in person mcgill assessments and just consulting in general for back pain and strength training and lifting form and weight cuts and whatever someone's looking for, as long as I 
you know, it's in my realm. I'll, I'll do my best to help. And, um, yeah, that's the, the best place to be able to find me. And uh, I'm also going to start writing again, more articles. So I haven't written very much in a while, but look for a lot of videos and articles uh, there. And uh, the thing is, you know, we mentioned this earlier, we put out content and it has to be in context. You're not going to be able to pick, cherry pick all these things from different programs and different articles I write because I'm usually speaking to a specific type of person during this one. So for these people that can't quite put together the program for them from Gift of Injury or Back Mechanic or 1020, the best plan of action is to get a consult so you can have custom directions and you're not just guessing. You're not just guessing. And the consults, Fail. yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And the consults, so you don't have to be in Jacksonville, Florida. You can do them remotely as well. Obviously, I'd imagine better in person, ideally, but um, ideally, it yeah, works well, Ideally in person, but... I've been able to help a lot of people virtually, thank thankfully. And yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So last question, is is there anything, we've covered a lot here, is there anything you wish I'd asked or is there anything that, you know, I, obviously you have your own YouTube channel and you have, you speak on quite a few podcasts, but is there anything that I've neglected to ask that you wish I'd asked or anything you wanted to talk about or you want to kind of, you know, say anything uh, i'm looking at the notes and it looks like we uh you know covered everything you know one, one thing is uh i appreciate your time and you having me on and uh i appreciate you sharing our work and uh thanks for the great questions and the great discussion and anytime you want me to have back on have, have me back on for a follow-up we can do that and maybe we could talk about 1020 life and my training approach for the people that aren't injured it, it parallels and it's the same types of things but we're not working from a deficit at that point, right? So it's a little different. Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be great. And um, yeah, stay tuned for part two. Brian, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, it. man. Good to meet you.